Imagine what you would do if you were Peter. Which, by the way, everyone should imagine that they're Peter sometimes because you just feel better about yourself. Larry is the only person who agrees with me. Come on. You ever, ever feel like just a knucklehead or an idiot? Well, just read Peter. Peter just didn't get it sometimes. Peter just said some things that just don't make sense sometimes. Peter, on the one hand, could sit there and go, call me and I'll walk on the water. And the next moment, he's drowning because he wavers between strong faith and no faith at all. Like in a very moment, whatever we're going through in our lives, we can look at Peter sometimes and just go, I'm not the only one that doesn't always get this. Amen. Imagine what you would do if you were Peter. It, it had already been a really really long night. The scripture says that Peter was one of three disciples that Jesus called to go into the garden of Gethsemane with him. Jesus, even though he had explained this several times, Jesus was the only one that understood what was going to happen that night. And he says to, his, to the three of his many disciples, the three that are there with him, Jesus says, Keep watch and pray. Because Jesus is under a lot of stress here. Jesus is under a pretty big burden here. Jesus is God and fully man at the same time, and yet he has never experienced death because God has never died. He's never experienced death suffering and agony to the extent of what he is about to experience. And it makes Jesus, in his, in his humanity, makes him afraid. So he says to these three guys that are supposed to love him, that are supposed to care about him, that are supposed to have his back, he says, keep watch and pray for me. Well, you just have to feel bad for poor Peter here. He keeps falling asleep, and Jesus keeps waking him up and disturbing his nap. Poor Peter. He's sitting there going, stay, stay up and watch and pray. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to do that. And he falls asleep. Jesus comes by, wakes him up, and says, can you not even just stay up and pray for an hour for me? And they're, they're, I'm sure they're all completely apologetic. Oh, we'll never do it again, Jesus. Not that any of us have ever said that about anything. And then Jesus disappears, and the moment that he disappears, they do what they said they would not do, and they fall asleep and leave Jesus on his own. It's been a long night. A couple of times, Peter has been awoken by Jesus. He's been trying to stay awake, and he keeps failing Jesus, and he keeps falling asleep. He is exhausted. And suddenly in the middle of your exhaustion, this large mob shows up and it shows up with swords and clubs. According to, to one scripture in a different gospel, this one focuses on the soldiers that have come. There's people that show up and they're angry and they're armed and you're tired. You ever been awoken that night with a, a sudden noise. And you wake up and just your adrenaline's kicking in, your fight or flight instinct kicking in. You're just, you don't even really understand everything. You're just groggy. You're just, you're just reacting. You're just doing something. Well, Peter and the others now see this large mob appear. Fear would be kicking in. Your adrenaline would be pumping. Terror would be prompting you to do the only thing that's smart in this situation and run away. And then you realize something. You realize something that is unimaginable to you. You realize who the mob is there for. You realize what the swords are there for. You realize why everybody is there. They're there for Jesus. And you're Peter. 
You've seen Jesus do things that only a couple of other people on earth have ever seen Jesus do. You have been closer to Jesus than most of the other apostles. You have seen Jesus feed 5,000 men and an uncounted number of women and children from just a few loaves of, of bread and fish. And you've seen Jesus walking on the water and you yourself have experienced God's power over nature as he calls you out onto the water. You've done things you never thought that you could do. And you have seen Jesus raise people from the dead and heal people from leprosy. You've seen Elijah... And Moses, standing by Jesus, as Jesus, the only time as he walked on this earth, he let this happen. His glory shined out, and he was transformed. And Peter saw this. Jesus has healed your mother-in-law. Jesus has cared for you. Jesus has been there for you. And now the crowd is there for Jesus. Now this man has done so much for you and done so much in your life. He's about to be arrested and you know Jesus. You know he's done nothing wrong. So what are you going to do? What Peter does is one of the two easiest things you can possibly do with faith. Peter tries to lay down his life for Jesus. He draws his sword. There's a whole bunch of people there with swords. There's people there with clubs. There's people there with weapons. They're expecting violence. They're anticipating violence. They want violence. They are ready for it. So Peter draws his sword and cuts off the servant's ear. He strikes him in the head. You know, probably is the aim like me. I would have been aiming for the chest and smacked him on the side of the head on accident. But, I mean, he chops this guy's ear off. And you know what? No one kills Peter. All these people have swords. What are they doing? These are the worst bodyguards in history. They're just sitting there going, well, that, that's unfortunate. Please don't, please don't hit us with your sword again. And, and something we don't get there is it's the presence of God that just stops them from doing what is a natural thing. But Peter pulls out his sword and hits a guy, and he is anticipating, I'm going to try to fight to give Jesus time to get away, and I'm not going to make it out of here. Peter tries to lay down his life for Jesus. And that's one of the easiest things you can do. And that's the opposite of the way that we're raised. That's the opposite of the way that we are taught to think. That's the opposite of what comes natural to us because we think the most important thing is to protect your life, is to save your life. But the easiest thing here for Peter to do is to die. Why? Why is that one of the easiest things you can do in faith? Because dying takes a moment. That's it. Dying takes a moment. We're not talking about someone dying over a couple years from cancer here. We're talking about someone being stabbed and killed quickly. It takes a moment. You know the great thing about moments? Is you don't have to think sometimes what you're going to do in a moment. You just react sometimes. Any of y'all ever just react and you don't think about it or plan ahead or figure out how is this going to work out in the long run? We just see something and we just, we react. It's easy for all of us to make decisions that have life and death consequences. It's easy for us to make decisions that will have consequences that will affect the rest of our lives. Because we're just reacting to the moment. Right? 
Most people don't plan on having children before they're married, and yet it happens because people make decisions in a moment. Most people don't plan on losing their house at the casino, but there's one more month, you know, I'm going to push my luck here. Most people don't think, hey, the first time I do this drug, like my cousin, will lead to 20 years of addiction because they just think about the moment. Peter didn't think about what was going to happen next. All Peter did was reacted to the moment. And he does what's easy. He tries to die for Jesus. By the way, the second easiest thing when it comes to faith is belief. It's one of the two easiest things. One is to die. The other one is to accept facts, right? It's easy when it comes to the Christian faith. One of the easiest things when it comes to the Christian faith is to say, I believe God exists, right? One of the easiest things is to say, well, the things that I have seen, the things that I have experienced convince me that God is real. I am acknowledging God's existence. I acknowledge that Jesus is God. It's one of the easiest things to just profess with your mouth that I believe in God. Right? It doesn't cost you anything most of the time. It doesn't even take time. And I've had a lot of people in my, in, in my life that I've encountered who are really just obsessed and focused on revelations and what's going to happen with the end times. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people come up and tell me that they're sure that, that we're going to get to a point soon in their lifetime that we're going to get to hard persecution. We're already in, in soft persecution in the sense that it can affect your job, whatever your religious beliefs are when it comes to Christianity, it can affect your job. But hard persecution is jail time and and losing your house and things like that. And I've had people my whole life tell me that they're sure that is right down the road. And they tell me, they assure me, they, they say it without even a shred of doubt in them. When that day comes, I am not going to be afraid to say, I believe in Jesus. It's an easy thing to do. And if the story stopped here, We would admire Peter. If the story stopped here, we would say, man, what an awesome disciple Peter was. He's the only guy who went into that situation prepared. I mean, he's the only guy that had a sword, and he was lay, willing to lay down his life. Way to go, Peter. What an awesome follower of Jesus. But then Jesus says, what are you doing? And everything goes downhill from here. Peter gets asked by his servant girl, you're not one of that guy's followers, are you? And the man who just a short time before was willing to die for Jesus says no. And this is not the last time the rest of the night, he is denying Jesus. The rest of his night, he is fleeing from Jesus. Jesus, who is suffering because of all of our sins. Jesus, who's suffering for Peter's sins. He doesn't even get to look in Peter's face and get at least a friendly smile among this large crowd of people that hate him and revile him and want to murder him and crucify him. He can't look upon Peter's face and get some strength and get some encouragement because Peter's gone. It is easy to die, but it is very difficult to suffer. And there's a, the history books of the martyrdom of Christianity have long lists of names of people who were willing to be arrested for their faith. And they denounced Jesus in the torture chambers because believing 
is easy. Dying is easy. But suffering is hard. Suffering is agony over an extended period of time. Suffering makes you doubt everything within you. Suffering makes you just want the suffering to stop. There's a report of one man who after hours of, cru- hours of, of, of horrible torture denounced Jesus. And this is during the great persecution of the emperor uh, Diocletian. And this other young teenage girl looks at him and says, you fool. You don't even realize you didn't save your life. They've already tortured you beyond what you can live, and now you've lost your eternal life. And he died. To save his life, he denounced Jesus, but he had already lost his life. And then he lost his reward. Because suffering is harder than dying. And suffering is harder than believing. And Peter shows that while dying for the faith and believing in God are two of the easiest things of Christianity, one of the hardest things to do is to live faithfully moment by moment by moment. Because if you die, the consequences are very quick. But if you live, then moment by moment you have pressure. Moment by moment you have temptation. Moment by moment you have people trying to get you to change and to turn from the way of God and to turn on something else. Moment by moment you realize your own failings. Moment by moment... Satan does everything he can to make you realize that in the short term, his path is a lot easier than Jesus' path. Because Jesus' path is narrow, and there's a lot of obstacles, and there's a lot of thorns, and there's a lot of heartache sometimes down the path of Jesus. But the path of Satan is broad and wide and easy, and it's flat, and it doesn't take a lot of hard decisions to make bad choices. And in the long run, it'll destroy you, but in the short term, it is so much easier. But when it comes to living faithfully, Peter says, I do not know Jesus. At one point, just to prove how much he doesn't know Jesus, he actually starts swearing. I'll prove to you how much I don't know Jesus. I'm going to act like someone who doesn't know Jesus right now. I'm just going to start cussing you out and telling you, I don't know this guy. What have you proved? What have you proved, Peter? How can Peter go from being willing to die to even, to not even acknowledging he knows Jesus as a person. Forget as God. Forget the divine nature. Forget anything like that. Peter doesn't even want to admit he knows Jesus as a human. How do you get from this point to that point? How do you get from the point of, I am willing to pull out a sword and die violently with with probably an intense amount of pain, but a very short period of time. How do you get from that to just him denying? It's because that time frame shows who Peter is at his core. Peter, all Peter does is show who he really is, okay? And who Peter really is, is he's a coward. He is a coward. That's all that Peter proves right here. Because this answer is not something that we want to hear. But you can die for Jesus and never have a relationship with Jesus. And you can acknowledge God's existence and never have a relationship with God. 
You can admit certain facts about God and never have God impact your heart and do anything in your life and change you in any way possible. You can acknowledge God exists like Satan does and never let that make a bit of difference in your life. And you can be willing to die because it's just a rash decision in one moment. But at the bottom of Peter's heart, Peter was coward and he never let Jesus change his heart he never let Jesus change who Peter was he never let Jesus do something different in his character when the pressure was on not to die but when the pressure was on to suffer all Peter had was himself And who was Peter? He was a coward. You know why it's so hard to live faithfully? Because if you don't let God change who you are, then when the pressure is on, the only thing you have is who you are. Moment by moment. Well, you know, I'll die for Jesus, okay? Will you stop lusting for him? Uh, no. That's, I mean, hold on. Jesus, you're kind of being intrusive here. Like, what are you talking about? Well, dying is easy. But letting God change the way you view women or letting God change the way you treat your spouse or letting God change the way that you treat yourself is a lot different. Well, I will stand up in front of anybody and say that I believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, then will you stop being selfish? Will you stop putting yourself first? Will you stop making it to where everything is, around, is about you? Well, no, because then what am I going to do? I can die because that takes a moment, but what about the moment by moment by moment when it comes to living in your faith, living in connection with God? For Peter, it was cowardice. For us, we might be selfish, we might be petty, we might be bitter or hard-hearted. We might think that I would die for Jesus Christ, and yet we're too afraid to tell our co-worker about the gospel of Jesus. (laughs) I'd lay down my life for him, but I'm not going to tell anybody about him. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I would profess in front of the whole world that I believe in Jesus. But that's not going to stop me from cheating on my wife, from cheating on my taxes, from lying, from causing all kinds of drama and conflict because our life is mired in self-destruction. The two easiest things are words and dying. But I got a secret for you this morning. Jesus doesn't want you to die for him. At least not yet. Jesus doesn't want you to lay down your life for him. Jesus wants you to live for him. And there's a difference. God is not asking that you would act rashly in a situation and let your blood soak the ground so that people could say that you're a martyr. What he is asking is that you will let him work through you and change the lives of everybody that is around you. What is he asking is that you would live moment by moment in the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. What he is asking is that you will live out the grace of Christ into everybody that is around you. What he is asking is that 
that you will open up your heart so that the Lord can look and see and say, this part's malfunctioning, this part's wrong, this part's corrupt, and cleanse it and excise it out of you and put his holiness and his goodness and his love in you. What Jesus is asking is not that you will die for him, but that you will let his love compel you to living a holy life that honors him so that the broken people that are around you can look at you and say, surely there is a God because God has made this person different. What God is asking for you to do is not to be a martyr. He is asking for you to be a disciple. Too many times we sit there and we come up with these big grandiose statements and puff ourselves up and say, I would stand up there and I want to. Hey, I'm not going to get the mark of the beast. Who cares if you get the mark of the beast or not? Most people will deny Jesus before they ever see the end times. Why? Because living faithfully is a lot harder than dying. But God is offering a call of his love into our lives. Do you realize that? God is not asking us to go out on our own. God is not asking us to do this just by ourselves and our own strength and our own ability. God loves us so much that he's not asking us to die for him. He's asking us that we will let God be God in us, even if it changes everything. And God will never leave us abandoned. God will never sit there and knock the foundation out from under our lives. God will never sit there and harm us or take advantage of us. God is the God that redeems us and loves us and frees us and transforms transforms us and on our own if we look at our own heart we know the worst of ourselves we know if we're a coward we know if we're selfish we know if we're petty we know if we hold on to grudges but with God I don't have to worry about the worst of myself because Jesus Christ kills the worst of myself and Romans 6 says the old self is dead and God brings to life a new creature in him See, on my own, all I got is the brokenness within me. But with Christ, I have something different. I don't have the messed up Brandon. I have Christ in Brandon. And somehow Brandon can do something different than Brandon did yesterday. And I don't have to worry about what's going to happen when the pressure's on. Because if moment by moment by moment I draw closer to God, the moment by moment by moment I'm becoming less of Brandon, though the Lord apparently has left me my terrible sense of humor. I'm becoming less of Brandon. And more free. And then my life is not controlled by fear my life is controlled by love how do i not worry you know i'm not afraid to share the gospel with my neighbor why because the love of christ is just working so much in me i don't have it's just a second nature Christ is the God, Christ is the full revelation of God on this earth. God is in the business of revealing himself. And so if we are discipled by Jesus Christ, we can't help but reveal who God is because it's just part of who we are. I don't have to worry about the next time someone says something against me because God is taking out the bad part in me and making it to where suddenly I can forgive when a year ago I couldn't have forgiven. Why? Because God doesn't Free us from those things so that we will not sin. God frees us from things so that we can experience the best of life in Him. When I'm talking about it's hard to live faithfully moment by moment, that is not a call for us to sit there and feel guilty and go, oh man, I'm a failure. It is a call to let God love us so much. That we're changed. In your marriage, maybe you're fighting because you just struggle for control. When God can make it to where you find joy in putting the other first. How is that possible? Because God is a lot bigger than us. Right? <laughs> If you're thinking your, your pastor's going to give you a two-step process to doing that, it's Jesus Christ. That's all. I, you know, 
We, we, we are not by nature people who put other people first, and yet somehow God makes it to where we can have joy. Man, I experienced more love putting someone else first than I ever did putting myself first. How is this possible? Because that's who God is. You know, I've been holding on to this wound for years. Well, you know why the Lord wants you to let it go? Because there's something better out there than living in the past chained to a moment of someone else's choice. This morning, I could take a poll and we'd all, because you know, we don't want someone to look at us and you know, judge us, so we'd all go, I would die for Jesus. Not me, y'all would. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to supervise all the deaths of Jesus. I'm going to stay back. We'd all raise our hand and say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'd testify in the moment of trial that I believe in Jesus Christ. But can we live in his love? Can we? That's why he's here. That's why he cares. That's why God is who God is.